Now, in her second year on the City Council, Deborah Juarez has always focused on legal advocacy. It started with a law degree from Seattle U. From there, she served as a public defender and King County Superior Court judge before working for the Governor's Office of Indian Affairs. I'm really happy that I'm 58 and I'm a cancer survivor and I have a disease MS that I will live and die with, but you know what? I want to be that voice for people that say you can have these diseases and you're going to be okay. All that and a single mom of two. Her latest challenge, helping to reshape the newly formed District 5. Hello and welcome to Council Conversations. I'm Josephine Chang. Today we're at Seattle City Hall with Council Member Deborah Juarez. Hey, welcome to the thank show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You know, since this is your first time on Council Conversations, I want viewers to get to know the person behind the office, a little bit about your background. I know you're one of six kids born to a Mexican-American father and a Native American mother. Correct. You're a member of the Blackfeet Nation. Mm -hmm. Growing and, up... And thank you for getting that right. People always say Blackfoot. <laughs> Oh, really? Thank you. Black feet. You got it. I wrote it down. I, good. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, would you say that you embrace both parts, all parts of your heritage? Um, you know, that's interesting that, you know, I, I think when we were, I was growing up, there was always this attitude like, well, you know, um, you're one or the other. The interesting thing is I never noticed that there was some kind of um, talking about walking into a world until I got older. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like I was one whole part. Um, the man that raised me, though, was my stepfather, who was Yakima. So I actually spent time on the Puyallup Reservation and the Yakima Reservation and then my own reservation in Montana. And then my father, um, I would spend every other summer with him. So um, I never made that distinction until I got a little bit older and I started seeing where people were kind of peeling off if they were more Native American or if they were more Hispanic, well, a Latina. And um, I guess it's, it, it just, I never really, I never really thought of it as, as um, being two like I said, till I got older, and then our, when I had to check boxes, when mm -hmm. they would say, because in the day you could only pick one, right? And I just <laughs> right. would pick Native American. More and more, everybody's going to be a yeah. lot of different boxes. Yeah, so right. that made so sense. So you grew up a lot in the Puyallup Reservation mm -hmm. in Tacoma, and yep. you have said that that made such an impact on you, that you attended a lot of tribal events, that the tribe really mm -hmm. influenced you. I just grew up in Indian country, that's what we call Indian country, with Native people, watching women be leaders, being head of tribal councils, um, I was involved when we took over Fort Lawton when I was 12, mm -hmm. um, when we took over Cascadia from the state of Washington, which is, became Puyallup Tribal Headquarters. Um, a lot of those events that I did before I even went to college, and that just seemed to me that that's what people did. I didn't know it was civil disobedience or that you were doing some radical act. It was kind of like we were just raised to say that's ours and we're going to take it back. We have a treaty right. Right. And speaking of that, you have talked about how when you were 13, 14, there was this historic decision by federal judge George Bolt, yes. which uh, basically reaffirmed Native American fishing treaties from the 1800s. And you can correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, but it, it says something basically like the tribes are entitled to 50 percent or half of all of Washington State's catch of salmon and steelhead, which mm -hmm. is a lot of fish. And more than that, it was seen as the most significant native rights it ruling was. in like a hundred years. Exactly. What was that like for you watching that? And I know you watched a lot of it. I think that if I ever write a story someday um, about my life, what I would always like to say is it's always full circle. I remember meeting George Bolt. He came to the Pelt Reservation. The judge. And toured the reservation after, after we won and got upheld in the United States Supreme Court. And then, you know, fast forward, what, 30 years? I'm one of the trial lawyers for Bolt too, for the <laughs> shellfish case. And for the same thing, we're fighting over the same treaty clauses, except for this time it was shellfishes, shellfish, uh, shellfish beds. It just seemed weird to me to be a 13, 14 year old girl and then be 34 and pregnant and trying the second bolt case in federal court um, 26 years ago and winning. And that case was upheld all the way to the United States Supreme Court. I was that's very proud cool. of that. Well, that's. It is come full circle, and it's also must have made a big impact on you growing. I mean, you probably never considered being a lawyer before mm -mm. any of that, right? I, the first lawyer I saw, I think I was 13. I always remember his name was Wayne Whiteface. And I remember I thought it was odd. I'd never seen a Native American lawyer. And so when I first met a Native American lawyer, I remember just being like, 
blown mesmerized away. and like walking, cool. you know, like, you know, how did you get to, I just didn't understand. And I look back now, it's kind of sad if you think about it, right? Because now we're a dime a dozen, and as well we should be. Um, but at the time, I just remember how profound and how powerful that meant, that here was a Native American man representing our people who understood us at a molecular level, um, not that it was some liberal white guilt or I'm here to save Indians. It was, I'm Native, I'm like you, I come from a tribe that has a treaty, I get what you're talking about. Right. You were the first in your family to go to college, Western, you know, Western um, mm -hmm. Washington University, and you were the first to go to law school, Seattle U. Mm -hmm. But you have said that it's not because you were breaking down barriers or making a statement or anything like that. What, what do you mean? Um, I'm really glad you asked that question because um, statistically, I should not be where I'm at now, right? Mm -hmm. I should not have gotten out of high school or college. I should either be prison or dead. Poor. There's all these. The statistical for Native Americans were the highest on just about every rate, any social economic indicator you can think of, and so for me it was always like looking to the future and saying I don't want to be any of those things. What I was very lucky, and I still do this even in my own practice, is I had so many aunties and uncles looking out for me in Indian country and on my Latina side that said, you know, college, you're going to go to law school, taking care of me, Roberto Maestas, mm, Bernie White Bear, yes. you know, Uncle Bob. Those were all wonderful influences in my life. Um, of course, still Larry Gossett, and I could name a ton of, and all of them are of color leaders that you know took all of us under their wings and just said, Carmen Judge Otero is the one who said, look, you could be a judge. And no one had ever picked me out to say I could be a judge um, because I think the yardstick was always the white male. And if you weren't that, then you weren't being, that's what they used to measure success, intelligence, creativity, drive, grit. It wasn't people you know like, like us, right? Yeah. And so, you Somehow, were a public okay. defender, and it was uh, then Governor Mike Lowry who mm -hmm. appointed you, right, judge of mm -hmm. King County Superior Court. What what did you take away from that experience? Because uh, being a judge is different than advocacy yes. roles that you've had. Being a judge was um, one of the best things I ever did. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, but I also think, now that I'm older and my mother was right, <laughs> the best thing was losing as well. Because I think when you lose, when you work really hard at something, but you know, I, I lost the race, somebody filed against me, Governor Lowry said come down to Olympia, you learn a lot about what you're made out of, integrity, character. Um, and I remember Justice Smith gave me some of the best advice ever, and one of the things he shared with me is that you know, people will watch you and pay more attention when you lose than when you win. And how you lose will define your integrity and your character and how you carry yourself. And that always stuck with me, like, you know, walking in the courtroom the day after the election, knowing that I lost, but knowing I had to finish my term and still be a judge, hold my head high, and feel like it's okay. It's not an indictment. It just, it was a, it was a race and I lost. Right. But having lost, did that give you trepidation about running for city council? I mean, jumping back in on such a well, you know high level, and this is a real public office. I mean, your face is out there. Yeah. Well, the thing is, um, between being a judge and now is about 25 years. <laughs> so I didn't jump right back in. Um, I had a couple opportunities for a couple other different appointments in between. Sure. And I just said, no, I don't think I want to be a judge. Because after working with Governor Lowry and, and also Governor Locke and doing a lot of economic development. Right. And getting office of more, Indian Yeah. Affairs. And then being legal counsel, working for tribes, doing economic development for major projects for tribes and for cities and municipalities, water district, rural districts, doing major projects like casinos, hotels, you know, fire station schools. And you, working on Wall Street, my world just got so much bigger. I couldn't imagine being on Third and James. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that I really got the bite of economic development and building things, and that's sure. what excited me. You know, it's like kind of like what really gets you excited. That got me really, really excited. Sure. Well, running for city council, you lived in the North End for more than 20 years. 30. More than 30 years. Yeah, 31 years. Just trying to, you know, not I know deep. my district. I know my district. <laughs> D5. You do. 13 and square miles. And this is, um, you know, a brand new district. With, I mean, yeah. did you see opportunity in Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I would not have run for office if we had not gone to a district system. Because I had uh, certain parties and tribes saying, you know, run for county council, run for Congress, run for city council. And I just thought, you know, the city is so big and diverse, I couldn't imagine going from West Seattle to North Seattle to, you know, with their interests, right? And I voted for the district system because I really believed in it. And I think coming from Indian country and living and knowing what it's like not to live and work with the people that you represent, seeing them at the gas station, at the store, at the dry cleaners, right? 
And so it made complete sense to me. At the dunk tank. I've the seen the picture <laughs> at your D5, live at D5 event. What was that about? Why did you get dunked? I'll tell Were you, you being why. called out? No, I, it, and, you know, my staff was not happy about the choice I made, but I, I'll tell you really why I wanted to do it. Um, we, we have a budget, right? And um, we lobby for our, our groups, and we had a couple really big nonprofits in our group. Kelly Brown of North Helpline and Elizabeth Dollar Rora Commons, who works with women who are trying to get out of prostitution and need services. So these two women I work really closely with on the social services. And I said, if I get a dunk tank, you women are going in it because you guys bug me every year budget. <laughs> I get you money, so now it's time to pay up. So Kelly showed up in a carrot outfit, and she was in the dunk tank for an hour. And then Elizabeth Dahl was in the dunk tank for an hour. And then I was in the dunk tank for half an hour. We raised $800, but out of that $800, wow. 290 was me. Uh -huh. So what does that say? More people were interested <laughs> in hurting me than those two. But, and then it went to a good cause. They both split the money. Sure. And we're well, going to do it next year. What have you heard from these district, you know, constituency hearings? I mean, what's a big issue in your district? Light rail, the big new light rail station being built near Northgate? Uh, yeah, the there's, there's a couple big things. I, there's a macro and a micro. The macro was Northgate light rail, the 130th Street light rail, um, our pedestrian bike bridge, um, our D5 chamber that we're putting together. But the micro stuff is what really excites me about being a politician. And probably this is probably the, the day I love most is Fridays in our district office in North Seattle College. is because constituents come in, it's for them, and then we have a map and they put a pin where they live. But it's going out there and putting up the stop signs. It's getting the, you know, it's getting the stoplight fixed. It's getting the bridge fixed. It's putting curbs up by a school. It's getting um, them to narrow a street to slow things down. It's um, getting a crosswalk painted. It's fixing the, the flooding areas. I mean, that to me is the height of what democracy should be. You should be able to have your council person and talk to them like this. I don't need to be behind a desk. And in fact, it is. it looks just like this. We just sit there and talk. And I think they're always a little surprised that I'm that accessible. And I really want to know what I need to fix and what I can and can't do. I want to end on a personal note the way we started, which was that it's just come out recently, although you've known for some time, that, that you have MS. Yeah. And that, that you've been a three-time cancer survivor. Does that give you? you know, a different perspective yes. on things. <laughs> and also you're, you know, single mom of two daughters. I mean, you're, you're a lot of new things to this council. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, and you know, I, I'm really glad you brought up the issue about the cancer and the MS because um, I want people out there that see this and hear this that, you know, you can have these kind of diseases, but it doesn't affect your drive or your heart or what you want to do. Um, having the cancer the, the first two times was pretty bad. Um, you know, the whole bald head, the chemo, the radiation. I happened mm -hmm. to work for a phenomenal All law right. firm that were, were good to me during that. Um, the MS I was diagnosed with in 99, and, and I've had my moments where I've been hospitalized. One time I went blind, one time I had a cane. Wow. But all that aside, you know what, it's like my mom used to say, you know, you're, you know, I can't say exactly how she would say it, it's a little salty, but basically um, you're not going to, you know, you, you come from good stock. Right. And this is part of it, because when you look at our ancestors and what our people went through and how many massacres and what happened to our people, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a miracle as a Native American, as a Blackfeet woman, that I'm sitting here when you count up the 18 massacres that took from our people, where we went from like 500,000 to 18,000 people. Somewhere there was a spark of life in each generation that kept me here, and my mom reminds me of that. So remind, this is a disease, and you know, you, maybe you will live and die with MS, but it isn't anything what your ancestors have experienced, and you're just, that's just not gonna take you down. What but she also life. says, you know, will happen instead is you'll just get hit by a truck. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> thank you so much, thank Council you. Member it Wise. It's been a pleasure. And, and thank you too. I really appreciate you coming down and getting to know the council members because we have a great we have a great uh, team here. We do. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to know more about Council Member Deborah Juarez, please go to seattle.gov slash council. I'm Josephine Chang. See you next time on the next edition of Council Conversations.